Who is Guati? Welcome to the Nonos Kunz Museum, David Nogadaga Museum. We're gathered here today for the fifth talk of the series, The Butterfly Effect. And this series asks a very simple question. Can small shifts in museum practice generate seismic change across our societies? In other words, what is the civic life and duty of museums today? And what meaningful and active steps can museums engage in when faced with the urgent and interconnected challenges our societies are encountering regarding the climate emergency and climate justice, regarding racial and sexual exploitation, wealth and health inequality, and technological innovation outpacing human comprehension. We know for a fact that museums have never been neutral, that they have mostly been a tool reinforcing a colonial and hegemonic ideology. <coughs> and in an age when this fact is actively being critiqued and dismantled worldwide, when the polyphonies of our world are demanding a paradigm shift, we ask, how can museums participate in facilitating and simulating such transformations, urgent and crucial for this change and also for our planetary longevity? Following the inaugural talk of the Butterfly Effect series last autumn by the New York-based curator and activist Lada Rajkovic, and then ensuing talks by the Oslo-based artist and curator Rafiki, and also Tromso-based scholar and lawyer in indigenous rights and a zombie, today's offering comes courtesy of Candice Hopkins and is titled New Models, Non-Colonial Institutions. Candice will speak about the genesis of Forge Project, where she serves as the executive director and chief curator, and how they work to enact models of native cultural self-determination, <laughs> demonstrating not only their feasibility, but their viability to other institutions to challenge colonial norms. The foundation and operation of Forge is a model, actually, for indigenous-led practices and for how institutions can function beyond their traditional remit to share knowledge, to redistribute wealth, and to act as an agent for justice. <coughs> Candice is a citizen of Carcross Tagish First Nation, and her writing and curatorial practice explores the intersection of history, contemporary art, and indigeneity. She has curated the exhibition Indian Theatre, Native Performance, Art and Self-Determination since 1969, which was held at the Centre for Curatorial Studies at Bard between June and November last year. She also co-curated Impossible Music with Raven Chacon and Stavia Grimani at Miller ICA also last year, and Soundings, an exhibition in five parts co-curated with Dylan Robinson, which has toured North America since 2019. Candice was the senior curator for the inaugural 2019 and 2022 editions of the Toronto Biennial of Arts, and part of the curatorial team of the Canadian Pavilion in the 58th Venice Biennial, and Sakahan, the International Indigenous Art Biennial at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa. And Candice was also part of the curatorial team of Documenta, three editions back. Before continuing, and as part of my own personal commitment for transformation, I would like to offer the following personal land acknowledgement to you. I acknowledge our institutional presence on sunny land, and I pay respect to the deep knowledges of its lands and waters and to all Sami people, and in particular to Sami elders and the courageous youth of today, as well as to the spiritual principles and world perspectives that have and continue to inspire Sapmi across all of its communities. <laughs> 
and I am especially grateful to all those Sunny friends and colleagues who have supported and continue to support me in a learning journey that will last me a lifetime. And now, without further ado, please join me in giving a most heartfelt welcome to our honored guest tonight, the phenomenal Candice Hopkins. Thank you, Katja, for that incredible welcome. Um, it's very special to be back here in Tromsø, where um, I have so many dear collaborators and so many people who inspire me and so many people who I care about. Raven and I were talking the other night and we realized that we have more friends here than we have in Chicago or Houston or even Phoenix. <laughs> so for that, um, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm here to speak about Forge Project, which is a new institution. And we say institution because we want to challenge what institutions are. We want to rethink them. We don't necessarily want to dismantle them altogether because we feel that through ideas of moving at the speed of trust, you know, that's how collaborations develop. We feel that by honoring um, the land that you're on, and once again, I'm grateful to be here to be hosted in Sapmi, by thinking about what you do has having more direct benefit for others than for yourselves as an institution, you might be able to have a kind of different praxis. This is the first slide that you encounter when you enter the website of Forge Project. And we actually deliberately don't call it a land acknowledgement because we feel that acknowledgement is perhaps too weak of a word. I think it's more rightly a land declaration. And the only way that you can enter our website is if you agree to it. And then, only then, do you have the right to continue. <laughs> we have a bit of a complicated relationship to um, native land in the Mahikanatek Valley, which is two hours of no uh, north of New York City. And the reason for that is because of quite profound displacement. Mohicanak people were displaced a total of seven times, beginning in the 1700s from this region, and then eventually landing all the way in Wisconsin, over a thousand miles away, because of an agreement that they made with um, Menominee Nation. So it wasn't because of government, it wasn't because of treaty, but it was because of the generosity of a sister nation that they're there. But what does it mean to run an organization, to have an organization, on land where there has been such profound displacement? What does it mean to enter into a relationship with people who are often absent in their homelands? What is our responsibility then? So FORGE was founded in 2021, in April of 2021, as something of a proposition. It's co-founded by Becky Gotchman, who's an arts most a recent arts patron, she hadn't been in the past, um, and Zach Foyer. And Zach for many years ran a commercial gallery actually in Chelsea and had kind of semi-retired to the Hudson Valley to work on local projects. Becky wanted to fund something that was deeply dedicated to social justice. She and her family were deeply inspired by um, what the momentum that had taken place during the Black Lives Matter movement. And I think for many of us during that moment, you know, I think that there was a call both for institutions to be dismantled, but there was also another call. There was a call for them to be wholly reimagined. Mm 
So we started small and we kind of started scrappy. We started here and in two buildings that we occupy that were designed by the artists and activists Ai Weiwei back in 2006 for, these were originally designed as a private home. But what was also taking place in 2020 and 2021 was a parallel movement to the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States. And that was the Red Power Movement, which hadn't been ignited since the 60s and 70s and all of a sudden you know the streets of Albuquerque where we were living were filled with almost weekly protests almost weekly calls for indigenous rights almost weekly calls for the recognition of the crisis of murdered and missing indigenous people and ancestors almost weekly calls for a different kind of future so I feel like, in fact, the years of 2020 and the years of 2021, at least where I was living, were a kind of moment where we could radically reimagine different futures. It was a deep reckoning around race, around class, around privilege, around the entangled colonial legacies that we've inherited, but we don't have to accept and are all together working to dismantle. So for me, this call implied two things, that there, was a, that there was still a belief in the value of cultural institutions, and number two, there was a belief that they could change. Many institutions went through something of an identity crisis because they re realized that with white directors, almost for the most of all, almost all the major institutions in the United States have predominantly white boards. And their staffing tends to be no, most diverse in front of house positions and in security. But that doesn't mean that those folks are in positions of power. So they realized belatedly that they were also upholding white supremacy. And then there was a kind of a scramble, and I don't know if it was similar here, but there was a scramble to hire consultants who worked on diversity, equity, and inclusion. They were paid very well, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there was the kind of broad institutional change that we were all looking for. And I think for Forge, the reason that we can operate the way that we do is precisely because we're not a museum. We don't have to abide by those rules and one of the reasons that we're not a museum is because, one, those have their roots in the very heart of colonial bounty. And much of that bounty was taken from indigenous people, either stolen from grave sites, sold under duress, and for the most part, taken without consent. What museums often do, too, is they create a false divide between different parts of culture, thinking somehow that there's a hierarchy between art and other things, a hierarchy between art, perhaps, and food sovereignty, a hierarchy between art and land justice. So it creates all of these kinds of false divides. So we, didn't, we weren't interested in those false divides at all. In fact, we want to lean into the kind of complexity of where culture happens. And that happens often when people come together. So from the beginning, we really embraced this idea of radical openness. What does this mean? We embraced it, the idea that we might be responsive, at least in our first two years, rather than directing what we wanted to do because we wanted to listen. We wanted to ask more questions than we wanted to answer. And we wanted to ask, in this place of radical absence, how could a native-centered organization make an impact? Is it needed? Is it wanted? Which practices will it center and uphold? And should this be at the basis of the founding of all organizations on indigenous land? We were also trying to prove a kind of point. And that is that one of the deep needs of decolonization is the redistribution of settler wealth. 
And one of the ways that we do this, um, now that we've transitioned to be a not-for-profit, actually just at the end of January we got our papers, is by, for example, if people visit Forge, we give 50% of the tour fees back to Stockbridge Muncie community where they're currently fundraising for a new cultural center. We feel like this is a kind of social contract that potentially other museums could take part in as well because they're often on indigenous <coughs> land too. So how do you directly give back? We circulate ways, you know, access free, or sorry, barrier free ways for people to support Stockbridge Muncie throughout almost all that we do. Because we need to ethically answer that question of how are our actions directly benefiting the community? We want to move away from traditional forms of patronage, which are highly transactional. And because of that, um, Becky Gotchman, who was our, our sole patron for the first three years of our operation and still um, funds some of our operating funding, she realized very early on that the best way she could enable us was to give us funding. She transferred all of the buildings over to our ownership, the entire art collection of 177 works, the properties, which include some 63 acres and three homes, so that it could be under the directorship of Native people. That was a pretty radical act, honestly. And right from the beginning, she didn't want to have any directorial role in what we're doing, which for an American model is quite rare. We also you know, recognize, and she recognized that by doing that, one, it could be considered a little bit risky, but again, then it made it so that it wasn't transactional and that it could be one step towards a model of giving back, and one step towards a model of encouraging others to give back, including to give land back. Because I think she recognizes, and we want other people to recognize, that their presence on this land, especially in the Hudson Valley, where there's a lot of wealth, these folks have directly profited from the absence and removal of indigenous people. So we wanted to ask ourselves, is this the beginning of a path of reparation? Is this potentially reparative? These are questions that are foundational to what we do and how we hold space, our sense of reciprocity, and in setting our intentions and in being transparent about it. So we sit on just about 38 acres. This is what we call the main house. And we sit between the villages of Taconic and Ancram in the Mahikanatuk Valley. And Mahikanatuk in Mohican means the water that flows both ways. So the area is named after the water. It's named after what is often called the Hudson River. But we're less interested in Henry Hudson and we're more interested in how the water flows. And it indeed flows both ways because it's actually not properly a river. It's actually an estuary. So right from the beginning, we thought that one of the things that this space offers, these spaces offer, is the opportunity to gather. It's the opportunity to think of time as well as something that's not transactional. It's something that doesn't already have capital tied to it or the idea of production tied to it. So one of the first acts of Forge was a, to invite four fellows, one of which being from Stockbridge Muncie community, to come and spend up to three weeks at Forge. And they each received a cash award with no strings attached. Now we host six fellows a year. Two of those are always from Stockbridge Muncie community with the same conditions and that is that there's essentially no conditions. If it's too, if you, sorry, say you have you know, family responsibilities at home and you can't spend <coughs> three weeks with us, that's fine. You can use the funds for whatever you like. You can use it for a down payment on a house if that's useful for you. And you also don't have to participate in any public programs 
because we understand, especially in those years of 2020 and 2021, I swear, you know, in that moment when museums were in crisis, it took almost weekly calls with them, you know, with conversations about how they could quite rapidly decolonize, how they could do strategic hires. And I realized afterwards that a lot of these conversations were actually deeply extractive because none of them necessarily you know, repositioned the poles of power. You know, it was always about us giving advice, but not necessarily us being in those positions of power. So here's our first gathering of fellows. Uh, we were able to bring them all back, you know, after they came one by one so that they could meet one another. None of them had met before. So we have Brock Schreiber, who's there on your left, and Brock is a Mohican language speaker. He's one of the first. Mohican is a sleeping language, so they're just in the process of waking it up. He's deeply dedicated uh, to teaching his children. So the only language that his children learn and speak now in the home is Mohican. And that hasn't happened for probably 300 years. It's been a very long time. Beside him is the architect Chris Cornelius, who is a NIDA. He is the first chair, indigenous chair of any architecture program in US history, and he's presently at the University of New Mexico. And beside him is the Ho-Chunk and Luceno filmmaker Sky Hopinka, who was living for quite a number of years in Hudson, which is a town just 20 minutes down the way. And beside him is Jasmine Niosh. And Jasmine is finishing up her law studies at University of Michigan. Jasmine's also an activist and is very forthright about that. And she's studying law so that it can better enable her activism. And so that she can hold, let's say, more or sort of larger figures, hold their feet to the fire. And then I'm beside them. And so the fellowship as well isn't dedicated just to artists. <coughs> we've hosted seed savers. We've hosted choreographers. We've hosted musicians. This is Laura Ortman using you know, one of the spaces at Forge as a recording studio. She was recording a soundtrack for um, a series that debuted on Showtime that was about the crisis of murdered and missing indigenous people in the United States. Um, we've hosted people who work in healthcare. So there's no restrictions, and there's a reason for that. There's actually quite a number of artist residencies around the world, so those of us in the arts are quite privileged in this effect. It's very few for seed savers. There's very few for activists. There's very few who are doing language work in their communities. So we, wa we want to help fill that gap. This is a small gallery um, in our space. And we recognize that because we're you know, relatively rural, not everyone will have access and be able to see these works you know, in real life there at Forge. So right from the beginning, the collection, which is a collection of native contemporary art focused on artists living in what is now called the United States and Canada, would be a lending collection. There's a number of reasons for that. One, the institutions that have largely ignored us and have ignored the development of contemporary native art since the 60s or before are predominantly in New York City. So we have our sights on them as targets. We've lent to a lot of them, and now they actually come to Forge to learn from our model by the bus load. So we've hosted buses from Whitney Museum, two large buses. We've hosted buses from um, MoMA. Actually, they all carpooled. They carpooled. We've hosted buses from San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. We've hosted director circles from these same museums and I think that they've realized that there's been a massive gap and that their ignorance is actually very glaring at this point. So when they come, they learn a lot. And I feel like much of the change in these institutions is actually happening at the level of those working in education departments, often first, and then second in curatorial departments. I think the directors are often, you know, the last to come to the table. Or at least that's been my experience. Very different here in this museum, I have to say. 
We are a lending collection as well of contemporary Native art because we recognize that as Native people on Turtle Island, most of our cultural wealth is now trafficable, which means that it's sold at auctions, it's held by non-Native collectors, it is traded by them, it is made into commodities by them, and it's often not returned to us. And any time we try to repatriate, there's often different ways in which people circumnavigate the law. And there is a law. And that law came into effect in the early 1990s. It's called the Native American Graves Repatriation Protection Act. And the first thing that folks did when they started to enact NAGPRA, as it's called, is they tried to get back the bodies of our ancestors. And now the museum that's kind of had its heels on the ground for the longest is actually um, the Hearst Museum as part of University of Cal uh, California in Berkeley. They still hold 9,000 ancestors in their collections. And the reason, the reason that they can cir circumnavigate you know, those rules is because they don't allow tribal members to come to identify those ancestors. So they say that they're unidentified and therefore they cannot go back. So we have a lot of work to do. So we don't want to participate in that. We want to you know, amplify the voices of those folks who do. But what we, we like to do is to work directly with artists so that we can invest in them. Most Native artists, until very recently, were not represented by any commercial gallery. And there was a huge valuation gap between their work and other artists who had similar exhibition records, uh, other artists of color with similar exhibition records. Zach, being a former commercial gallerist, saw this right away. He saw this valuation gap, and he's been working behind the scenes to fix it because this is very necessary as well. And it's starting to happen, things are starting to change. You know, and this is starting to change by having major survey exhibitions like the one of Jean Quictusy Smith at the Whitney Museum that was just last year. Major group exhibitions that contribute to this knowledge so that we don't have to be ignored anymore. But we do a lot of other things as well with our loan program. One, we don't charge fees unless it's to a for-profit organization or institution. And I'll give you an example a little bit later, but when we do that, we always work with the artists to ask them where the money should go. So it always goes back to their community. And in some cases, that's for you know, land justice. In some cases, that's simply to help the family. We also reduce barriers to access by, in some cases, turning loans around as quickly as three weeks. I don't necessarily recommend this, but we, you know, we try to do that. We make all the information we have and the images of the work available on our website so that it can help with public knowledge. And that's directly linked to our collections database so that things are updated in real time. I feel like museums, because of their protocols, often create a bit, lot of barriers to access to collections because collections are inherently their wealth. And so it's something that they try to protect and control. For us, what we're interested in is making sure that where these works go have good relations. If they don't, then sometimes we decline a loan. If the, if the relationship feels extractive, then we'll decline a loan. We also do a lot of work on the loan agreement to ensure that artist rights are upheld. So the way that we do that is often if we get a loan agreement coming into us from the borrowing institution, many times in that, it'll include little lines that say that they can use this image of the artwork any way that they want. Publications, for marketing, even to put it on a, you know, on a mug or a t-shirt and to sell it, all without the artist's consent. That is the norm. So we always change that so that they can't do any of those things without the artist's consent. The other thing that we do is always in our credit line, you know, it shows that this work is coming from the Mahikanatuck Valley, 
So it comes from a place. It's not a placeless work, for example. It comes from a home. We also consider ourselves custodians and stewards and not owners of the work. This is not our wealth. <coughs> These belong to the artists. Through our programs, which are directed by Sarah Biscara Dilly, my colleague, who's Northern Chumash, she really functions on, as she said, and I'm going to quote her, she says that, as indigenous peoples, our protocols are intimately tied to our places and kinships, while remaining embodied as we move through the places and kinships of others. A guiding understanding that respect for the protocols and relationships of other native peoples, alongside our own knowing of the world's outlines a responsibility to the everyday dis diplomacy that we engage in as Native people. That's a really important line that she just said, the everyday diplomacy that we engage in as Native people. And she says that this knowledge is a critical part of what informs our relationship to the Place and Lands Forge project currently stewards in Taconic, New York. So here, this is an event um, that's centered around food. One of our values as an institution is on hospitality. So we don't invite people to forage without feeding them. That's really base for us. We don't invite people to forage without feeding them, without offering them something to drink. Um, and with this, you know, sharing of food often comes, you know, sharing of stories and sharing of knowledge. We also deliberately center communities of color in much of the work that we do. And then as I mentioned before, of course, we center Stockbridge Muncie community. And the way that we do that is far beyond um, a land acknowledgement. The way that we do that is actually through legal terms. We have a memorandum of understanding with Stockbridge Muncie community that outlines shared values and shared programming for the next three years. And it was in development for an entire year. And now it's in front of tribal council to be signed on their end and ratified. And also by their president, Shannon Holsey. Most important of that memorandum of understanding is also the appendices. The appendices around, are structured around indigenous intellectual property, the protection of that, as well as how these kinds of relationships can be formed at the speed of trust. So really it's about how we honor and respect each other's knowledges. And with an MOU, it means that, you know, our relationship is also mutually agreed upon. It's mutually agreed upon at all levels of governance with the community. It also outlines how we work with community members as consultants as people that we invite to come uh, to, s to spend time with us, as fellows as well. And I do feel like this is indeed a way that institutions should formalize these relationships with the people whose lands they're on. Because I feel like a land acknowledgement is actually the very beginning of the declaration of a treaty acknowledgement. And land acknowledgements, at least for U US institutions, should not be said if you don't have any existing relationships or if those relationships aren't good. You shouldn't say it because then it's entirely performative. I also feel like it should outline, you know, not just a past people's presence on a land, but your future actions together. So that's part of our ethos. And part of our ethos and partnerships and programs is around what we term indigenous world building. And we do this by thinking about how we create frameworks for community-based work. And we do this throughout for thinking about how we create programs that are actually just centered and directed by and for indigenous people. So we do a lot of what we call indigenous-centered programs and those are not for outside audiences. And we also do public programs, and that's when we share out. And I think this is an important distinction because we realized one of the things that we have at Forge is time and space 
We have bedrooms where we can host people. And this is actually pretty rare. It's pretty rare to have that. And it's pretty rare for an institution to give over, let's say, almost an entire week. The entire institution given over to, you know, to what people or what the participants want in that moment of time without any obligation of public performance. Um, this is my colleague Paloma Wage visiting Monique Tyndall at Stockbridge Munsee Community in Stockbridge Munsee's um, garden. Their garden produces annually 13,000 pounds of food for the community, which they sell um, in front of the tribal council offices at very low cost. You know, you can get a giant squash for a dollar, which in the United States is pretty good. And they're also bringing back, you know, seeds that haven't been planted in those for them buy and buy them for hundreds of years as well. Monique Tyndall is one of our closest collaborators. She's the cultural affairs director at Stockbridge Muncie Community. And she's also on our Indigenous <coughs> Steering Council, which is a governance committee that sits above our board, which means that no matter who constitutes our board, which at the moment is almost all Indigenous, we will always be Indigenous-led. So we won't replicate what are a lot of issues with not-for-profits in the United States, and that is they start to be controlled by those with the most funds. And that doesn't tend to be Native people. Um, this is a program that we did for community. And this is Misty Cook, who's also another close collaborator of ours from Stockbridge Muncie community. We worked with Misty at the very beginning of Forge. And we invited her to come to the land. She's a traditional knowledge holder around medicinal plants. So she did a plant analysis. She found over 30 plants that were growing there that have medicinal use. And importantly, we decided that we weren't going to make that knowledge public because our protocols dictate that we can't forage for plants on other people's home territories unless we're invited to. So we don't want to encourage others to do that. However, the plants are there, particularly for those who have the knowledge and when people come and visit their homelands. So this is Misty and her daughter speaking about some of the plants, but only those that are more commonly known. So this has led to kind of more radical land remediation uh, work that we've been doing at Forge. So Forge, as we saw in the earlier photos, and Zach, my colleague Zach says this really well, he says it used to look like a golf course. So it was entirely mown lawn and probably, you know, heavy use of pesticides before we took over the, the, the land. And one of the first things that we did was we simply stopped mowing. You know, seeds can lay dormant for over 100 years. Some of the first seeds that sprouted were milkweed. Others were plantain. Plantain is a medicine. And that tends to kind of grow underfoot, usually, you know, where people walk or where animals walk, so on trails. And we noticed as well that what started happening was there were more insects, there were more animals. And not only were there more of them, there were more kinds of them. So we wanted to take this further. And so we've worked with an allied botanist, Claudia Vispo, and allied landscape architect, Jamie Purrington. And Claudia, together with her colleagues, have made a native seed mix for us that we will be planting this spring. And we have welcomed formally those seeds back home. And for us, what we want to do is to introduce this as a model in this region, where people often turn to mowing as a way to control the out of control tick population that carries Lyme disease. They do it because they think that they're controlling nature. And many of you know that you can't do that. You can't control nature because something else always tips out of balance. And when we first started this process, last fall, we planted a cover crop. And as Sarah likes to say, once we did that and um, we disturbed you know, the first layer of land to get out those very thick roots of lawn grass. She said that uh, the birds were really popping off. 
I got really excited. And I think that there were a lot more um, bird babies this year, so we'll see, because they're pretty active. Um, and what I also noticed is the soundscape had changed. So I heard different insects I'd never heard before. I heard different birds, and it was louder than it had ever been. And also when I'd walk through, we have a few mown paths. Um, things like the groundhogs would scream at me because very clearly this wasn't our land back, it was theirs. And they were de very much declaring their presence. This is Ruby Kerr's daughter uh, gifting Sarah some traditional seeds, some corn seeds, some purple corn. This is a gathering that we hosted last fall called Estuaries that was for indigenous critics. And we'll be doing an open call next year for this. Um, and again, this was an example of programming that was done by <coughs> and for indigenous people with kind of no onus to make any part of this public. So no onus for any other people to benefit from this knowledge except for us. This is Claudia Vispo sharing the seeds and sharing how to tend to the land. So we make the tending of the land communal. We have meadow work days where we invite people to come in to learn about um, what Claudia calls exuberant species. She doesn't like the term invasive and how to you know, control them or work together with them. She teaches them what she knows you know, about the seeds that are there. And then we all work together. So this is what it looks like now. Very, very different than what it looked like then. And this summer, it will look different yet again. This is Sarah uh, making tamales. And this is some um, Iroquois food from uh, chefs from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So we've been working with you know, relations and people all throughout New York State and beyond to share meals. You know, we come with generosity. This is Rainer Pulsolt, who was a a uh, fellow from Stockbridge Muncie community who's working in mental health. And he works in mental health because he says that's one of the ways that we can stop the cycle of the trauma of colonialism. And he's really invested in stopping that cycle, which he says is inherently intergenerational. This is Margot Obeda, who was one of our fellows last year. And this is an example of what I was talking about before of the art collection. So we lent this to a TV show called Rutherford Falls, which hired all native writers. And it was on uh, the channel called Peacock. If you ever want to watch it, it's quite funny. And they have hosted an exhibition of the real artist, Natalie Ball. And they wanted to borrow one of our works. So they borrowed this one. And we said, you can borrow it. But first, um, we ask for a fee. We ask $1,000. And then we worked together with Natalie, and she directed that fee towards the Klamath water dispute. These are just examples of some of the works in our collection and how you can view it, how you can see it. There's different ways that you can navigate this. There's different ways that you can explore it and learn from it. So what, these are some of the more recent acquisitions that we've made. Um, this is Catherine Blackburn. This is a bag <laughs> made of quills, feathers, and it says Masi Cho. And Masi Cho, in her language, in Dene language, means thank you. So it's like those, you know, those plastic bags that you get that are printed with thank you, but here this is a very different kind of shopping bag. This is a work by one of our fellows from last year, Suzanne Kite. It's sewn on deer hide with conductive thread. And she's a composer. And she likes this idea that it could you know, conduct electricity, so it could be amplified. And these are all based on very old Lakota symbols that have deep meaning for her and Suzanne as Lakota. And this is another, another example of a recent acquisition by Rachel Martin, who's Clinkett, who was also a fellow. One of the other things that we do with the exhibition is, or with the collection, is that every five years we host 
a very comprehensive, in-depth exhibition, group exhibition. This is the first. And this was called Indian Theater, Native Performance, Art, and Self-Determination Since 1969. And this was uh, curated by myself with uh, research by Amelia Russo, who's the director of collections. And it was looking at a little known intersection between the self-determination era, which officially started in the 1960s in the United States, and it was really spurred by the occupation of Alcatraz in 1969, as well as the development of new native theater. And that movement also started in 1969 at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It looked at how self-determination as a kind of practice and praxis you know, has been the very foundation of our work as indigenous artists you know, since the beginning of contemporary art. It also looked at how um, sculptures, for example, are performative and have agency. It also looked at the different ways in which we take roles you know, throughout our practices for very different means. When you entered the gallery space, you were confronted with these two mask paintings from 1971 by Lloyd Kiva Nu, who was the first president of the Institute of American Indian Arts which was formed in 1963. He was also the one who started with Roland Meinholz, the new native theater department in 1969. And they did that with a document that acted as a kind of treatise, and it was called Indian Theater. And in that document for Indian Theater, they had different propositions for what they thought native contemporary performance was. And they also included scripts. What I also appreciated about that document is that they named all of their collaborators, including their students. And they started something pretty radical. In one of these first halls, as you entered the exhibition and you turned to the right, you saw this moment of radical native resistance, and that was with the occupation of Alcatraz. The reason that's called the origin of the self-determination era is because when they occupied Alcatraz in 1969, a lot of the people who did that occupation were students, native students at the University of, at, of Berkeley, California. They did it under Lakota Treaty. So Lakota Treaty, and this part, this clause in the treaty hadn't been upheld, said that any federal surplus land would be given back to the Lakota. And a few years before, Alcatraz Island had been deemed surplus because the prison was no longer operational. And so for the students, they wanted to test this law. So they occupied it. But they didn't just occupy it. They started Alcatraz Free Radio. They started Thunderbird University. They started a healthcare and food distribution system similar to the Black Panthers and they were working actually alongside uh, the Black Panthers and the Young Lords, which are Puerto Rican activists. And they offered a proposal to the United States government that I think was over 100 pages of what they would do with this rocky island that they said, similar to Indian reserves, had no electricity, it had no running water, it had no food. So if you know the trends in native land ownership in the United States, you know that most native people were often moved to places uh, that, were, that had no infrastructure, deliberately so. And it was then President Nixon, people are always surprised by this, who actually was receptive to their demands. And they determined that they could have Alcatraz Island but only if it was run by National Park Services. So they said no. But that, you know, that campaign for self-determination didn't end there because they successfully lobbied President Nixon to then drop the Indian Relocation Act, which then, in, by 69, was the single largest federal government land grab of native land in contemporary history. I was also interested in how Native women were showing the roots of abstraction on Turtle Island. 
The painting called Grey Apron that's on the center wall is a painting by Kay Walking Stick, and it's from the late 1960s. And in this painting, at the same time, she made the declaration that Native women are the earliest abstract artists in the United States, thereby taking, taking back and extending the history of abstraction in those lands back thousands of years. And she's right, because if you look at Lakota beadwork, if you look at parflesh bags, if you look at you know, the culture production of Cherokee people and Kay is Cherokee, you'll see that abstraction is a language that Native women have spoken through for a very long time. Here's another room that was really dedicated to sound and performance. And you'll only get a snippet of this, but what was also important for me was that Three times during the exhibition, there was a concentration of performances where many of the works were activated, including the one at the rear of this photograph, which is a constellation of works by Eric Paul Reach. And in the foreground uh, is, a, is a work by Kite that is a score. On the opening days of the exhibition, Rebecca Belmore was commissioned to make a new work, and it took her a long time to determine what she wanted to do because she wanted to make her mark she was looking for a certain kind of earth, and it took over a week to find it. And when she did, she and a collaborator, Dana Warren, painted on the outside of the museum this X with the clay that they made by mixing that earth into a slurry with water that's always been known as sacred to Mohican people. What she realized only later in finding this perfect pile of earth that was directed to us from a staff from Bard Farm was that this perfect pile of sifted earth was actually from an archaeological dig that was demonstrating the presence of Mohican people and their ancestors on these lands for more than 5,000 years. We also run a digital journal. These are some examples from it. We publish We've now published the work of more than 20 authors, many of them first-time authors. And we have an open call for this too. We also pride ourselves in paying some of the best rates in the industry, which is a dollar per word, so that we can set the standard for other institutions who often operate from a framework of scarcity instead of abundance. These are some of the more recent articles. And where I wanted to end, where I wanted to end this was to return to the land. <laughs> the land is a place of gathering, and the land is a place of rematriation. So this is a video taken by my colleague Sarah Buscara Dilly, and it's just their drive home from work. So thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. <laughs>